do that. David, John Wong, uh, and Tony Whittenham uh, assisted me in, in building this Mustang for General Romer because I know nothing about Mustangs. Now I know a lot about Mustangs. So thanks, guys. And as I'm going through this, Dave, do you want to add anything by all means? Because you were there as well. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's see if we can't fire this up and start sharing. Okay. Hold on. Everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So everyone knows who Richard Romer is because if they don't, they will soon. Most Canadians do. Of course, Mark, you know who he is because I presented this last time, but it's about this journey of um, from, from plastic to pilot uh, and building an accurate RCAF Mustang one. And you'll see in a moment what we mean by that. Okay, so uh, back in August, I received an email from the aide de camp, uh, which is the Air Force's uh, term, the Army uses adjutant. Uh, basically, the, um, the secretary, if you want for a better word, uh, the second in command, so to speak, uh, to help uh, with uh, a senior officer. In this case, the aide de camp for the Honorable Lieutenant General Rich Romer is Major Rick Rangel Braun. Um, who, by the way, happens to, I, I actually worked with, with Rick briefly uh, with the city of Toronto because he's with um, uh, emerge, uh, sorry, paramedic services. Uh, and I, I did the planning for, um, uh, with public health on the COVID numbers. So it's a small world. Uh, so when I got the email saying, hey, we need to talk to you, I thought was some kind of trouble. <laughs> uh, hmm, when do you get an email from an aide to camp, right? Uh, they heard I built scale models. I do scale models for um, the regiment I'm attached to, which is the, a horse guards unit. I build training models for them. Um, it's it's a recce unit, uh, reconnaissance to Americans. And I guess, you know, how things, um, rumors start, they say, there's a guy that builds models. And th they, they wanted a model to celebrate uh, the general's uh, uh, upcoming 98th birthday, which, by the way, is actually January. Uh, it's, it's coming up in, I think, a week or, or two, but they wanted to give this something to him as an early birthday gift for November 11th. So that kind of sets the context. And of course, I called on David, Tony, uh, and John Wong to help. Also, a, a fellow by the name of Colin Ford from Australia. Do you guys know Colin? That guy knows everything about Mustangs, everything. So with the help of these um, souls, brave souls. Uh, I embarked on on an attempt to build Romer's Mustang. So, who is Major General Richard Romer? Um, Hamilton, born 1924, still very much alive and well. I just got an email uh, from him today, actually, um, and I'll tell you a bit about the reason of that. And uh, he's basically been serving. Uh, he joined up. He told me when he was only 19 uh, and became a trained in a, as a fighter pilot flying missions when he was 20. That's to give you a sense of, of how young these guys were. That's him on the left. He told me that picture was taken in front of his Mustang one at Gatwick airport um, in England, in London. Uh, he's uh, in his life. He's uh, been a lawyer. He's been an author, many different books, and uh, he's the chief of defense staff for the Canadian Armed Forces. So basically the highest ranking officer um, that they that they still consider to be a, a brother in arms of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, and he is, by, by my belief, one of three surviving Mustang pilots from World War II, according to Colin Ford, and probably the sole leading survivor of the D-Day Battle of Normandy uh, in terms of uh, aviation uh, pilots. That's him here in the photo in the circle in red uh, with uh, 430 Squadron. Uh, out of Sudbury, uh, and uh, those are his squadron mates. Again, he's sitting in front of a Mustang One. Uh, now, so we're going to do a Mustang, and, and again, I'll just go through this very quickly because, uh, you know, you can read all this when we post it later. Which Mustang did we want to build for the general? Well, 72nd, 48th, 32nd. We landed on, uh, well, first of all, we wanted to know which ones he flew, and David, you're very helpful. And 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 do, do you want to say anything about the, re the the research that you did at this point? Not to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, just it's just brief stuff. Like basically, it was researching uh, his his call letters for or his call letter for the for the uh, Mustang. It's a recon. It's a it's a recon Mustang, right? So yep. it's it's a single it's a, it's a single call letter. That's why you got the M R and J there. And then we just did some other research about which one. Uh, once we decided which 
which aircraft it was going to be that he flew. And then we decided uh, as to ensure that we had the right color scheme. We had mm. the, because there was, there's differing opinions out there yep. and, and uh, also the right call letters and the right, and the right um, serial number. Right. Yeah, I think it was either you or, or, or Tony, even going through the archives, we found that there was an error in one yeah. of the quotes, right? So Yeah, it was it was myself. Like if there's archives online for the for the specific date. So for that one there at the very bottom there, the J, which is uh, July 17th, 1944, 1600, 1640 hours. Uh, you know, there was a, a couple entries and in, in the logs, and the logs called, I think one of them was AP178, which is that one there. And there was another one that was AP, I think, 198 or something like that. Mm. And there was a, and it, it just, it didn't make sense. So it was just doing the research to determine, you know, what is the actual correct number. And there, the error is clearly the fact that once you start looking into it, you realize the error is on the part of the, of the recording person, the person who actually took the, the information down. Yeah, well, so there you go. You can never always rely on what you read. You have to do that background check. So, so there you go. Thanks, David. So the one we chose was AP-178-J. Um, this was chosen under the theory that Romer would better remember this uh, aircraft because it's the mission that he uh, spotted uh, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Uh, see the little painting on the left there. Uh, and the, uh, the book cover for his book uh, shows AP-178-J on the right. Um, but there are some slight errors in this artistic rendition, which we'll get to in a moment. So which kit? So we thought, well, there's a variety of scales and we thought, well, you know, General Roller's approaching 100. If we did a 144th Mustang, I don't think he would see it. <laughs> so we landed, I landed on, well, let's do the biggest one we can get. There is no 124th Mustang one. Uh, so there is a 32nd scale one, which are these two. Uh, and Tony uh, Whittenham was kind enough to uh, donate his um, Mustang Mark 1A to me, which is this guy. I did not know, but these, these Mustangs are incredibly rare. So if you have one, hang on to it. Um, I tried to get a replacement for Tony. I couldn't find it. And if you do see these things, they're, they're going for like two, $200 on eBay. I didn't realize that they're they're that uh, rare and they're they're not great kits but they're the only game in town i'm not going to go over the other ones here um this one here by the way is is according to john wong equally hard to get the academy p51 mustang north africa so if you have that one that's that's rare too so we land on a 30 second scale one and i'll just go briefly over uh, why we did that i talked about this already it's the only 132nd kit of an early allison powered mustang but there needs to be a lot of modifications done. So here's the conundrum. Can you just build a Mustang one to represent the recon unit that Romer flew on that fateful day in July 44? No, you can't, because here's the conundrum. The Hobbycraft RAF Mark I version here has the proper camera, which is in the back, although it needs modification. And it has a corresponding, the open window for the camera lens, but has an incorrect See, it's got incorrect protruding wing mounted cannons, and it also has no nose guns, which Romer's Mustang, it didn't have the protruding cannons, uh, and he had nose guns. So uh, the P-51A version over here has the non-protruding wing guns uh, and does have nose guns. So you kind of got to cross kit these, uh, but given that they're so rare, I'm not going to buy two of these, have two of these and cross kit them. So I took this one and I modified it. Uh, and the list of modifications, without going over this, the details, because you'll read it later, are really as follows. Um, if you are building a Mustang Mark I, the early ones did not have a Malcolm Hood canopy. No Mark I's were fitted with a Malcolm Hood, even though the kit came with one. Uh, uh, thankfully, Hobbycraft provided the alternate correct canopy. Also, the Mark I's didn't have the triple underwing recognition lights, which you'll see on this Hobbycraft kit. Um, they're, they're under the wings on one side of the, the wing. It looks like a traffic light. Uh, and Colin Ford said they didn't have them, fair them over. The radio antenna behind the cockpit uh, is, is the wrong shape. But interestingly, uh, again, some information from Colin Ford out of Australia states that these um, uh, were all basically VHF uh, uh, um, radios. And so there's no wire between the antenna 
and the tail leave the wire out so i i didn't know that these little details do make a huge difference if you're a mustang one affectionado for the early mustangs the um under left wing basically there's a little pedo head mounted under the right wing that's where the pedo is and then on the other side there's a little um kind of like a a pole um a dipole fitted on 1944 to all mustangs so you, you'll see that in the photos that needs to be added one of the fundamental problems with mustang kits um is that well actually before i get to that number six um it's a, there's a tiny there's a few surface details that need to be removed under the kit um it looks really minor but to the mustang guys it's really important but get back to to what i said earlier there's a couple of things that you still need to do one is um the cockpit um the itself number eight right there was there was a little metal box on the bottom which operated the the camera uh, and even romer mentioned to me that 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 there was this lar large black uh, box at the foot where his foot was and he mentioned it because there wasn't a lot of um, room in the cockpit so you have to add that little box uh and uh otherwise it, if you look in the cockpit well how did the guy turn it on well it's this little um box that turned on the camera and operated the camera i won't go over the details of the camera itself i'm just going to talk about one other major thing uh number 12 um you guys who are Mustang fans, sometimes the guys say that when the Mustang is parked, the doors drop, but not on these early Mustangs. They were held up in the lock position. There's a whole bunch of debate on the on the internet. They should be in the up position. However, after some thorough research and some information from Colin, um, the mechanics had a latch that dropped these doors. So you can you really can do it either way, whether they're locked up or down. Um, if you follow these these intense Mustang discussion groups, they will be arguing over their children as to which one is, is right. Well, both are right. Um, so here's what I had to do because I didn't have the P-51A. I had to take the protruding uh, uh, gun tubes off the cannons and replace them. These are basically a 230 cal. That's a 50. And I just built these up with... Um, epoxy putty uh and i really had to redo this whole thing i had to move the landing light what what we do to make an accurate mustang right so that took a lot of work probably the most work um and i did that if there's anything that you leave this presentation of it's this apparently and correct me guys if i'm wrong every mustang kit out there regardless of scale has this issue um the um you can see here i'll, I'll take this this photo here the wheel well rear wall is incorrect on pretty well all mustang kits out there uh, it's because <coughs> it follows the the kit manufacturers all follow the the shape of the actual wheel well like its angle but in reality the rear a uh, wall of the wheel well uh, aligned with that rear spar here so you can mm -hmm. see this area is actually hollowed out and you really need to do that if you're if you're building an accurate mustang you have to cut that wall out and rebuild this which i did over here that's very important regardless of where you're doing a mustang one or any other mustang so again you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but pretty well every mustang kit has this issue which means that you'll have to modify that colors and markings uh, standard raf day fighter scheme i'll show you pictures of the model in a moment not going to go through all this stuff um, but it's basically the gray green camouflage and I'll show you pictures of the, of the finished model. Um, there's a couple of, um, controversies when I went on the web, uh, one of the ones that I found on the, uh, one of the discussion groups was that a lot of the, 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 um, Mustang experts were saying there was no single Mustang in 430 squadron that had D-Day stripes around the whole aircraft. There's no photos of them. They didn't exist this this they're saying this picture is wrong uh they did not have uh, the full stripes surrounding the fuselage they were going on about this but hey when i when i had the opportunity to ask the general um you got to do it in a sensitive way because they you know what color was this they, they don't really care um when they're in combat but he basically remembered vividly that this the d-day stripes were around the entire fuselage and over the entire wings uh, his aircraft was one of the few exceptions he said and he remembers it because that's the aircraft he flew that day when he spotted uh romer so here you go what you have on the internet that states uh one thing is in complete reality completely different when you talk to the pilot that actually flew the aircraft 
Okay. Uh, these are just some pictures of Mustangs that are really dirty, and I'll tell you why I'm showing you these dirty Mustangs. Uh, they're pretty dirty. Look. Uh, now, somebody will, some people have said they had laminar flow, they were very clean, they had to keep the mud off them. So um, why am I showing you these? Because a lot of the guys on the internet said these Mustangs were fairly clean. Well, when I asked the general how dirty were these, um, he gave a different answer, which I'll show you in a moment. And so I uh, weathered my Mustang like I would an armor piece. Now, here's a picture of um, 430 Squadron. Uh, so that's his squadron uh, in France in a forward operating base. You can see the fields were all mud. Um, the, I, it's probably hard to tell which one of these aircraft was his. Nobody, it's too fuzzy. But here's the cockpit, uh, standard Mustang One cockpit interior uh, with the uh, RAF cockpit green. Again, I'm, I'm not a Mustang expert, but boy, was it helpful getting all the info from the guys to do this correct. This is not the Hobbycraft cockpit. It's the set from Vector. Uh, really nice resin set. Uh, nice there, nice details. Oh, by the way, that the camera would be in that position you'll see in a moment. There's the camera right there. And by the way, in this early shot, I painted it in OD green. Then I found out that they were like a, 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 like a light gray color. There's the box that operates the camera. That must be there. So that's not included. And that's that's pretty obvious feature for details of the cockpit. So here's a couple of shots of the dirty Mustang. Um, I got the, I replicated the exhaust to match photos. I put a ton of um, mud uh, using primarily oil paints and make products. Um, and it's kind of hard to dirty up an aircraft like an armor, but hey, there you go. They, they got dirty. Um, I had to add a few features like this protective plate, which protected the, uh, the fuselage from the muzzle blast from the nose guns. I had to add these guns in and, and uh, drill this out. Um, there's another shot of the wing root area, including the dirt and the accumulation. Notice he said that uh, the D-Day stripes were applied by brush and brooms. That's the way he described it. They were not straight and they were not aligned. That's why they're all crooked. There's another shot of the radio, the F-24 radio. Uh, the undersides, that's the front looking end of the business end. And that's the aircraft overall. Had a good time, fun time building this, learned a lot. There's the AP-178. The only um, correction we made is that the, uh, the J goes forward of the roundel, not at the rear as on the, the cover of his book. And then we present. So uh, we were invited to the Canadian Forces Base Borden on November 11th as part of their uh, Remembrance Day ceremonies. Uh, it was an uh, all military uh, event only. And uh, David, you were there, uh, Tony was there, and John was there as the uh, only civilians, which we really appreciated the red carpet that they rolled out for us. How many people were there, David? Do you recall? Uh, so probably I mean, uh, at the actual ceremony yeah. itself, probably about, I'm going to guess around 40 people, yeah, but it was, small, it was right? mostly, yeah, it was mostly military. There were civilians on the, on the, on the edge yeah. outside watching, but it was, it was mostly military. Fabulous ceremony though, eh? Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Totally was. So then after the ceremony, we headed over to the officer's mess uh, at uh, CFB Borden. And uh, these pictures are, are basically what uh, the, the sermon is all about. So, so in the officer's mess, um, these are all the, uh, one of these guys is the base commander. I think he's the base commander, I, I can't remember. And uh, these are all some of the senior officers and a group of um, um, Royal Military College cadets who just recently graduated are over here. So it was nice to have them there as well. There's the Mustang model. Um, we all kind of said a few words. I mentioned a, a, a bit about uh, the build. And, and this is the Ge General Romer um, looking at the model. Um, and um, I think John Wong taped the whole thing, but uh, he made a couple of comments. Uh, and in terms of dirt, I'm, I'm quoting him. These aircraft were dirty. This is him talking because we operated from forward bases off mud fields. We landed, then went straight back up. There was little to no time to clean them. The only thing they kept clean was the windscreen, which they wiped to clean off any dirt and oil. And then he said, this is exactly how I remembered it. I'm 20 years old again. And that, that, that kind of hits the home, you know, the fact that, that, that we did something, we accomplished it. The pilot really loved it and said, it's exactly what it looked like. These are some other photos of um, 
the officers just taking pictures of the model, which was which was kind of nice to see. They're not modelers, so they were they, the the other the other little side anecdote uh, in this group. I can't remember which one of these guys it was. He was um, over in Afghanistan as an aircrew uh, ground crew chief, uh, and uh, when he looked at the model, I didn't bring it up, but he said it's it's about time that somebody weathered an aircraft because he said even even the aircraft over in Afghanistan from jets to helicopters they got really dirty. Uh, and, and he said, most of the time he sees things on the internet, they're way too clean. So that was kind of like a nice check-in, uh, to say that, all right, we, we did a, a, a competent and good enough job on the weathering of the aircraft. Again, army, Navy, and air force all in one room. <coughs> yeah. These are the cadets. I think, yeah, they're all achieved their rank of, he's a captain. So we've got some new ones with uh, no rank yet. They're probably officer cadets. That's uh, the aide de camp, General Romer. Just having, we're having a chat about, about the Mustang. It was great. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's us. David, do you have anything else to add? That's pretty uh, well. No, I, I, think, I, think that's a, I think that covered it, Harv. I think it was, yeah. I was, I was impressed by the entire experience. And uh, to be able to uh, to sort of tag along and doing the research was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was right. It was a it was a great deal of fun, and, and it's a little bit of detective work and that type of stuff. And uh, hmm. uh, the moment Harvey said, you know, uh, I need some help with 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 some research on stuff, I was I was right there into it. Uh, yeah. It's I'm a I'm an an, I'm a analyst at a financial institution, so uh, research and analysts analyst type of stuff kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, that was very helpful. I'm glad you guys could make it up. Um, just, just a side note, even none of you guys know. So um, while I was um, surfing the web on Facebook, have you guys heard of, um, there's a fellow uh, out in the Netherlands, he does colorization of World War II photos. I think his Facebook uh, is, is a piece of Jake. I'm yes, old. I've heard of him. Right. So, so I was, I was looking on his website and here, let me just, let me just call this up. He did this. And I, this was only like um, maybe a week and a half ago. Hold on. Let me just call it up. Do you see this? Hmm. That's, that's uh, the work that he did through computer colorization to take that, the photo of um, General Romer here and add color to it. And you'll see, um, that that uh, the original photo and you'll find out on the internet is black and white i think that's so well done and there was a whole bunch of um discussion on it and then i chimed in and, and humbly and delicately said you know the guy's still alive and we just built uh a model for him and they were he was more than happy to allow me to use this so i modified the video and used this color version i sent this photo with his permission to general romer and I just got an email back today and, and he, the general's like floored. He said, oh my God, can you imagine all these years where you've been looking at a black and white photo of yourself and all of a sudden there's this color version. So he's very happy with, with the event. He's, now he's happy the fact that uh, this has appeared and, the, and he's even more happy that it, it's a guy from the Netherlands that did this because he helped liberate, <coughs> liberate the